and ui is a zero second assumption a constant variance which is a variance is a sigma square right and to talk about ui term assumption number three ui uj zero covariance right or you can say zero correlation assumption number four xi ui zero correlation right and basically our signal and noise uh, no relationship so let's uh talk about them one by one first one assumption number one zero mean this assumption is really really simple so that i will show you actually uh this assumption number one will be will be always satisfied as long as we have intercept alpha again as long as, uh, as long as we have alpha in a regression assumption number one will be always satisfied so <laughs> not a big deal so let me show you our assumption is a ui has a zero expectation right let's say suppose this is violated let's say suppose ui has a non-zero let's say five expectation in this case uh then what shall we do very simple so let's do a little transformation let's rewrite our equation right here suppose ui's expectation is five right so let's do a little trick in the sense let's minus five and a plus five so that we don't change anything right so let's let's define ui minus five to be u star let's define alpha plus five to be alpha star so that we can rewrite our model into y is a function x so that the corresponding error term is u star right so that i'll show you u star gonna satisfy our assumption number one again our assumption number one is error term is a zero mean right Beforewards, since we assume the ui expectation is five so that we do a transformation so that after the transformation u star is a new error term right so that let's show u star gonna satisfy assumption number one again how do we show really really simple let's see the proof is since u star is u minus five right u minus five so that expectation u star expectation u star is expectation of ui minus expectation of five right expectation five of course is, is five right expectation ui by your assumption is is five so five minus five so you you star the expectation is five minus five is, which is a zero right so that we just have proved that the u star has a zero mean again right so that so that we just did a little trick so that uh, we arrange a little bit plus five minus five so that we can always make sure our error term is centered at, at a zero right so that's why assumption number one short answer is a no big deal it will be always satisfied as long as we we have an intercept alpha in our model the so alpha itself you don't have to do anything alpha will be you know all of there can always make sure the zero mean for ui term you know to be always true that's a short answer. So we have already finished assumption number one very quickly. So assumption number one, no big deal. It will be always satisfied as long as we have alpha. Now let's talk about assumption number two. Assumption number two, assumption number, question. Mm, no, we, we don't. Uh, so far for our all of us beta hat, we only need these four assumptions. <laughs> right, 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 right. We always uh, do the transformation minus whatever is the, the, the mean, <laughs> right? So if you say every term, the mean center to be five, then be minus five. If centered at to say 10, then be minus 10, right? If centered at to say negative three, then be minus negative three. In other words, we plus three, right? Whatever, whatever you know, numbers. So we can always uh, correct uh, the, the mean to be zero. Yeah, exactly. Now let's talk about our real business, assumption two. <laughs> assumption two, assumption three, that's the focus of this chapter. So this week, let's uh, talk about assumption two. Probably we have to leave assumption three for the, for the next week. So let's do assumption two. 
Assumption two, we say the variance is a constant sigma squared because we showed variance of ui could be rewritten to expectation u squared minus the expectation parenthesis squared, right? The first guy is u squared first and then take the expectation. Second term is the expectation first and then squared, right? So from assumption number one, this guy is a zero, expectation is a zero. So zero square, of course, still zero, right? That's why together with assumption number one, variance is this expectation square, right? So that this assumption number two, you can rewrite it into variance is sigma square, same thing, right? So that's why assumption number two, equivalently, you can say, we, we assume the variance of ui is sigma square. Sigma square is simply a constant. So we don't know the value of sigma square. Sim we simply assume it's a constant. The constant by definition, constant, it doesn't change. It doesn't vary over, doesn't vary over i, it doesn't vary over anything, right? It's always a constant number. So, so let's introduce some terminologies first, some jargons. If variance equals to a constant sigma square, we call it homoscedasticity. If this assumption violated, for example, suppose a variance is uh, something like sigma square i varies by i, then we call it heteroscedasticity. For example, variance is sigma square i. So this is heteroscedasticity. So how do we remember this? You know, homo means the same. So the first case, this is a same variance. The same variance doesn't change at all, right? So homoscedasticity means variance is the same, and, you know, same constant number, sigma square. Second case, sigma square i varies by i, so we call it heteroscedasticity. Hetero means different, so that's why the second case varies by i, so it's different by i, right? That's the that's the terminology, homoscedasticity, heteroscedasticity. So in the next exam, I'll ask you, how do you spell heteroscedasticity? <laughs> <laughs> of course, I'm kidding, <laughs> because uh, there's no way for me to give you such a question. <laughs> I have to spell heteroscedasticity for you, right? <laughs> so short answer, in this course, no matter for our homework, for our exam, we can always use a uh, abbreviation. Homo, you know, maybe you use a little dot. Homo stand for homoscedasticity. Hetero stand for heteroscedasticity, right? So, so you know, to make our life easy. So that's the terminology. So equivalently, you can say is error term is homoscedastic or heteroscedastic. All right, <laughs> you know, that's a different. Uh, uh, aberration. So first of all, our assumption two, sigma square, we assume we are in the nice homo case. In other words, we assume the variance doesn't change. It's always the same number. So that is easy, right? If this is violated, we are in the bad hardware case, right? More complicated, right? So first of all, let's introduce the conclusion. Before words, we assume we are simple homo case. Now the question is, uh, what if this nice assumption violated? In other words, what if we are in the bad hetero case? What happens to our all or less beta hat? I'll directly tell you the conclusion that uh, you don't have to prove, but I'll show you how to prove it. Very simple. First of all, the conclusion is that uh, all or less beta hat is still unbiased, still consistent, but not efficient anymore, not efficient anymore. So, so in other words, the first moment, they are still fine. First moment means the expectation of a beta hat itself, right? Second moment means the variance, right? So right here, the first moment is still correct in the sense, you know, it is still unbiased. In other words, bias is a zero, right? No bias at all. But but inefficient, inefficient means the variance will be larger than before, right? So that's a short answer. So the first moment is still fine, but second moment will be will be wrong, right? So how do we figure this out? Or how to how do we prove this? 
Actually, really, really simple. Recall the proof we did before, before midterm. So we have two proofs. The second proof, we derive the expectation of beta hat. We derive the variance of beta hat, right? Still remember when did we need assumption number one, number two, number three, number four? <laughs> Especially when did, where did we need uh, assumption number two? Actually, when we derive uh, variance of beta hat, we used uh, something two and uh, something three. Still remember when we derived the you know the variance of beta hat. It's a uh, it's some something square, right? So the expectation of something square. Then we derive this something square. Actually, we we further decompose into square terms plus two times those interaction term, right? So the first term is expectation of a ui square. The second term is expectation ui times uj, right? So that so so the so on so first. So that short answer. If if you, if you forgot this one, simply what happens to you? If you forgot the, the details, simply check out our previous uh, proof. You're gonna see. You know when did we when did we use uh, these assumptions? Sh short answer. Actually, both our assumption two and assumption three. We we used the both of them. Then we derive variance of beta hat, right? When we derive our expectation of beta hat, actually we didn't use assumption two or assumption three. We only use assumption number one, number four, right? So that's why that's why you know if our assumption two violated, it only affects the variance of beta hat, right? That's why it only affects the efficiency. The variance will be not as same as before, right? But to the unbiasedness expectation, still the same as before, right? So that's the reason why I, you know, I let you guys do this kind of exercise so that you know where does those nice properties come from. Those those nice property, unbiasedness, consistency, efficiency, they're true under what assumptions, right? So so you can go back to revisit so that you can figure out very easily. So the right here, we do not re require this proof. You can check it out by yourself. But short answer is that if assumption two violated, our all or less, all or less beta hat is still unbiased, still consistent, but not efficient anymore. Not efficient, we call it inefficient, right? Inefficient, the variance will be bigger than before, right? Uh -huh. uh, right, if, uh, if uh, in, in the nice case of homo, of, of course, assuming other assumption also true, right? So, you know, all those nice properties still true. It's unbiased, it's consistent, it's efficient, the ideal case, right? So that's the conclusion. What if assumption two is violated? And so we know first moment still fine, second moment violated. This is issue number one. You know, if if assumption number uh, if assumption two violated, what happens to all of less beta hat? This is issue number one. We already talked about the conclusion. The second issue will be then how do we test in your regression? How do I supposed to know, you know, assumption two is true or false, right? So that we can introduce how do we check assumption two, true or false? We'll introduce two different ways. One of them is a quick uh, intuitive way by using graph. The second way, it will be a formal test, just like the t-test, f-test we learned before. We're going we're gonna to use a number, something like a p-value to compare. So let's introduce. The, the first way, uh, let's use an example. Um, our, uh, we're going to use a chapter 5.1. These uh, are codes, we use a package called LM test. In a second, I'll show you where do we need this LM package. But short answer, you know, we can install this very quickly. Install LM, LM test package. LM test package stands for linear model test. So that for, for, the, for the next homework, you're going to need this uh, package. Let me clean up everything. And uh, let me clean up everything to... By the way, these little brooms, if you click, if you click this guy, it's gonna clean everything in the memory, clean up everything we created, you know, beforewards. So click, yes. So it's brand new now. It's starting from uh, you know. 
So we're going to use the uh, chapter five, this chapter. Let me make sure it's, uh, yeah. So we're going to use the cigarette data set and uh, warning message. Yeah, anyway, so I'm going to run the all or less regression. So we have the coefficient of L, uh, coefficient LNP, coefficient LNY. Our Y is a uh, left hand side of variable is uh, LNC consumption. So, so that uh, this is basically log log model. Those coefficients, they are elasticities, right? So, so the price elasticity is negative 1.3. So it's a 133%. The income, income, the coefficient is a 0 0.17. So the elasticity is, uh, uh, Right, 17%, right? <laughs> so that's basically the elasticity. So first of all, suppose we have such an all less regression. We want to know our assumption two, true or false, right? So actually we learned this before. We learned something called residual analysis. We're gonna plot a graph, residual over X, residual over X. Residual is U hat. Right? Residual is U hat. So that you can plot U hat over X. You know, in my example, I have X1, I have X2, right? So that first of all, if you want, you can plot two residual analyses, right? U hat over X1, U hat over X2. So, so that let's check out the one by one. The first graph, let me plot the graph and uh, uh, right here, the Message says a uh, margin figure margin is too small, uh, too too large actually. <laughs> so that uh, it just means uh, the error right here is too too small. So that let, let's make it bigger. Let's plot the graph again. Uh, still too small. Well, now it works. So plot the residue over x one. And uh, the computer command is uh, all or less dollar sign residuals. All or less dollar sign residuals. So this is my U hat, right? This is my U hat. LNP is my X1, so that I plot U hat or X1, right? And uh, if you like, um, if you like, you can add, uh, where is it? You can add the uh, horizontal line at zero. So our command is A, B line. H equals to zero. H stands for horizontal line. Uh, horizontal line at zero. Similarly, if you want to add a vertical line at, uh, say, zero, it will be V equals to zero. So it sounds right. And uh, line type, double quotes, dash, so that I want to draw a horizontal line at zero, which is line type is a dash line. Right. Equivalently, you can you can use number LTY. LTY equals to two should be dashed. One is solid line. Two is dashed line. Three should be dotted line. Four is uh, those uh, you know the slash dot slash dot <laughs> sounds worse. You can try those by yourself. So let's see. Now I have the the first graph. This is my residual analysis. My U hat or X one. Similarly, in a second, we can we can check out U hat or X2. So recall, how, how do we use this residual analysis? Before words, actually, we talk about this, right? So a residual analysis, we try to check out the variation of residuals because under assumption two, variance of UI is a constant. Constant UI means the variance UI is always the same. No matter, no matter when your X is a small, medium, large, the variation of your UI is always the same, same variation, right? So since we don't have the true UI, so that, that's why we use a UI hat, right? UI hat residuals, you see UI hat to replace the true UI, right? We want to, from the graph, we, we want to check out the UI, UI hat, the variation is that really, constant or, or or really varies, right? In my graph, for example, in the middle, the variation is kind of large from here to here, right? And at both tails, left tail, variation is kind of small. Right tail, variation is kind of small, right? 
especially especially observations are kind of kind of small right here. I have only one point, only have a couple of points right here, right? But anyway, from my graph, it looked like its middle variation is kind of large. Both tails variation is kind of small. So that from this graph, it looks like my assumption two probably violated because ideally under assumption two, everywhere, the variation should be the same, right? But in my graph, it looks like in middle, large variation, both tails, small variation, right? So it's a signal, probably assumption, sub assumption number uh, two will be violated. Similarly, you can plot graph uh, u hat over x2 so that you have another, another residual analysis. Right here, the pattern is uh, the left tail variation is kind of large, right? Then you move to the right, variation is kind of getting smaller and smaller, right? So basically, as long as we find some pattern, any pattern, as long as the pattern is not the same as constant events, right? As long as you find any pattern, it's a signal probably assumption two will be violated, right? So this is a, uh, you had over uh, X2. If you want to make it, want to make it simple, uh, want to, you know, if you prefer a single plot, you can plot U hat over Y hat, U hat over Y hat, What's our y hat? Y hat basically is a linear combination of all those axes, right? So, you know, basically something times x1 plus something times x2, right? So that's why y hat is a linear combination of my axis, right? That's why, for example, if you prefer a single graph, you can plot all of the dollar sign residues over all of the dollar sign fitted values, right? U hat over y hat. Let's see. So that we got such a graph, right? We also find some sort of pattern, you know, not constant, not constant. So these are the very quick residual analysis. It's quick, it's intuitive, right? But the bad part about this uh, residual analysis is uh, it's, it's informal. In other words, maybe different people have different opinion of, <laughs> about the graph, right? Maybe the graphs to some people look like uh, the, we have sort of variation. But some people, uh, to me, it looks kind of, <laughs> kind of good, right? So <laughs> that's why it's an easy, quick way, intuitive way, but not a formal way, right? A formal way will be we prefer some, some numbers so that we compare what is 0 0.05, right? And that's the and that's the formal way. How do we do the formal way? Let me show you. We're gonna use the package LM test. I, I just installed this package just now, right? Very quickly. If uh, if your computer doesn't have LM package LM test package, you can you can install it right here. Packages install. Click install and type LM test, right? And and inst click install, it can install very quickly, right? I already have that one so that I, I don't need to install again. So the first line, library LM test, we load the package into, into computer memory so that we can use the command. The command is called BP test, all or less. All or less is our all or less regression. So that we want to, we want to do a test, we want to do a BP test, for our all or less results. Let me show you the result and then introduce the theory. BP test should for Brutch Pagan test. This test is proposed by they two, actually, separately. <laughs> they two, the two persons almost at the same time, they propose the same test. So that's why we named the test, we use a Brutch Pagan test, <laughs> you know, I give both of them credits. So First of all, how do we interpret the computer results? Very simple. You can always directly jump to the p-value. You can always directly jump to the p-value. You know, whenever we got a whatever test, you know, no matter it's a chi-square test, no matter f test, you, want, what, you know, theta, whatever test, you can always directly jump to the p-value. Right here, our p-value is a 0 0.03, uh, 37, right? Anyway, it's less than 0 0.05. Just like before, just like a t-test, just like the f-test, if our p-value less than 0 0.05, our conclusion will be 
we will reject the null, right? Right here, what's our h null? What's h null? What's h1? Right here, very easy to be, very easy to remember. h null will be always a nice simple case. H1 will be the, 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 you know, the bad opposite complicated case, right? Right here, our H now, the nice case is homo. In other words, in our lecture, lecture notes, the nice case is, where is it? The, our H now is right here. You can either write this or directly write, variance is sigma squared. Variance is a sigma square. That's a homo, right? Opposite H1 is variance is a sigma square i. It varies by i. It's hetero, right? So in short, the BP test, in short, H now is variance is variance of ui is a sigma square. It's a homo case. The opposite H1 is hetero case, the sigma square i, right? So based on our p-value, we reject the null, see? Our, our p-value is smaller than 0 0.05, so that we reject the null, right? Our h null is nice homo case, right? We reject the null so that it goes to our h1, bad hetero case. So that basically, based on the computer results, we know actually, unfortunately, we are in the bad hetero case. Right? <laughs> so that based on our conclusion, we introduce if we are in the bad hetero case, if our assumption two is violated, our all or less beta, all or less beta hat is still unbiased, still consistent, but unfortunately inefficient, right? What's the big deal of uh, inefficient? If, uh, if we go back to all or less results, if we go back to all or less results, Inefficient means, you know, first, first of all, first moment is correct means the first column, those betas, beta one hat, beta two hat, they are all correct, right? Inefficient means the second moment, the variance or equivalently standard errors, they are too big, right? Second moment, they are wrong. If the variance is too big, then correspondingly, you know, the standard error, there will be too big because then error is square root of variance, right? So large variance means large standard error, same thing, right? If our standard error is too large, then think about the third column, T, T ratio. T ratio is the first one divided by second one, so that we got a third one, right? If our, if our standard error is too large, then what happens to our T ratio? First, uh -huh. too small, right? <laughs> too small because T ratio is the first one divided by second one, right? If our second one is too large, so that our T ratio will be too small, right? So that if I got a small T ratio, what happens? Basically, before maybe ideally your T ratio might be larger than 1.96, but right here, because your assumption two has been violated. So, so that your T ratio will be small, smaller than 1.96, right? So that short answer is that if assumption two is violated, our T test result will be affected, right? Before it might be significant, but right here, because of assumption two violated, so that the T ratio right here will be small, smaller than 1.96, so that we cannot rejects and now it's now anymore right <laughs> or equivalently you can say t ratio right here is small equivalently p value will be large right that's why we got a large p value right here so that we don't have any stars we don't have any stars not not a significant right <laughs> so that that's why, that's the short answer why, for, especially for this guy. So that our t-test result, you know, we don't have any stars right here. We got a large p-value, larger than 0 0.05, right? So that uh, based on your t-test result, this guy, basically, your income doesn't affect your consumption at all. So that, you know, based on all or less, you might run into the conclusion, okay, income has nothing to do with uh, consumption. Feel free to omit 
Inca, right? But later on, I'll show you actually, you know, of course, income, of course, affects our consumption. The wrong conclusion right here is because our assumption too violated. Any questions? Uh, consistency, so far we can understand consistency as a weak version of unbiasedness. <laughs> unbiasedness talk about first moment expectation, right? Consistency, so far you can, you know, theoretically, of course, we learned before. Unbiasedness and the consistency, they, they do not imply each other, right? They're totally different. But so far, you know, you can understand as a weak version. A consistency could be understand as a weak version of unbiasedness. Condition on the, the variance, you know, shrink. So, you know, they simplify goes to infinity. So that's basically a short answer. So that's the big deal of assumption two. If your assumption two is violated, then your test results could be wrong. Your test conclusion could be wrong. So that based on t-test result, you might conclude, okay, I can omit L and Y. I, you know, income doesn't affect my consumption, right? But of course, eventually I'll show you, you know, it, it is, it, it's wrong. Of course, income, of course it affects our consumption. So that's our, that's our BP test. The details about this uh, uh, BP test, we do not uh, require, but simply remember, you know, uh, as long as given the test result, you can understand, interpret the result good enough. Then the third issue, the third issue. So far, based on the test, we know, okay, we do have hetero. We, we unfortunately, our assumption to violate it so that we do have hetero, right? So that, the issue number three, then what shall we do? If all of us is not efficient anymore, right? How do we recover the truth? How do we gain the efficiency again? How do we re reduce the, the, the variance, right? The conclusion is we're going to introduce something called GLS. We're going to introduce something called GLS. GLS is stand for generalized least square. So that eventually this GLS will be efficient again. So that let's introduce this uh, GLS. GLS actually takes steps. We're gonna do some uh, steps, then number one, step two, step three, so on so first. So that by doing this uh, GLS, so that eventually we calculate beta hat GLS, beta hat GLS will be efficient again. Let's see, how do we recover the truth? The idea of this GLS is Let's do this. First of all, first of all, <laughs> let's do a transformation from the original formula, original equation. Original equation is right here. Now the problem is uh, this guy, error term, the variance is not a constant, right? The variance is a sigma square i. The variance is sigma square i. So that let's do this kind of transformation. Very, very simple. Everything, divided by sigma i, everything divided by sigma i. Again, what's sigma i? Sigma i is a variance of ui sigma i squared, right? So that basically is the square root of a variance, which is a sigma i, right? But anyway, everything divided by sigma i so that we get to this kind of equation, very simple. Now let's denote some notation. The first guy, y over sigma i, let's call it y star. Alpha divided by sigma i, let's call it alpha star, so on and so forth. X i divided by sigma i is x star, so on and so forth. So that we have uh, our y star, x star, so on and so forth. And similarly, u i divided by sigma i, let's call it u star. Now, once we have this uh, y star, x star, so on and so forth, so that we can show that u star, u star, this guy, again, satisfy our assumptions now. Then now, beforewards, our ui is bad. Bad in the sense, ui is hetero, right? Now we can prove after the transformation, u star is nice again. Nice in the sense, u star is homo. No, u star is homo. 
How to prove? Really, really simple. By definition, by definition, u star by definition is ui divided by sigma i, right? So let's show if you square u star, u star square is u square divided by sigma i square, right? So that we got uh, right here. So the bottom right here, you know, it's a constant. So that let's put outside the expectation. So it's expectation u square divided by constant, right? So that on top expectation u square by, by assumption right here, it's sigma i square, right? The expectation is sigma i square. So that sigma i square divided by sigma i square, so that reduces to one. One, of course, is a constant. So that if we just showed, you know, variance for ui star, ui star, the variance is a constant, which is a one, right? So that we did, did very, proved very quickly. U star is nice again, because U star, the variance is constant one, right? So we just need uh, the error term variance to be a constant right here. Of course, one, of course, is a constant, right? So that we've very quickly, we showed that U star is nice again. So this proof not required, but uh, as long as you understand, uh, you know, this, this kind of transformation, after the transformation, U star is nice again, as long as you got this intuition, good enough. So, so our GLS, very simple. So we're gonna, uh, question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a, uh, this is a, uh, Right here, where is it? Uh, variance, variance of UI could be equivalent to expectation UI square, right? So the same thing. So now we are doing GLS because, because we are in the bad hatter case, right? So, so that's why we, you know, we got this kind of equation. Uh, anyway, based on the discussion right here, the idea of a GLS is really, really simple. And step, step number one, we calculate our Y star and X star. How do we calculate? We simply Y divided by sigma I, X divided by sigma I, so that we calculate our Y star, X star. That's step number one. Step number two, once we have Y star, X star, we're gonna run the regression Y star or X star, so that correspondingly, we, we got our beta hat. This beta hat, the beta hat from this regression will be nice again because corresponding error term is nice again, right? So that the our step number two is we're gonna run a regression y star or x star to find the co corresponding beta hat, right? To find the corresponding beta hat. This beta hat we call it the beta hat GLS. That's the simplest solution. Now now, just now, actually, we cheated a little bit by saying we do a transformation y divided by sigma i, x star is x divided by sigma i. I call it a cheated because sigma i is something we do not know. We don't know the true value, right? So that, that's why you have to put another step in OS. In other words, we have to calculate sigma i in OS so that we can, we can divide by sigma i, right? So how do we calculate Sigma i, we use this kind of formula. We use this kind of formula. The sigma i square, we calculate, uh, or you can say, we estimate this by using residual square. U hat is a residual, all or less residual. We simply square the residual as an estimator for sigma i square hat. So that we have the we have the step. You, maybe you can either call it step zero or something, right? So that you can you know calculate the very first step. So that you can calculate y star, x star, and then do the GLS uh, you know transformation. So that let's summarize the steps. The first step by using the all or less residue, square them so that you can estimate the sigma square i, you know sigma square i. Second step, once we have the estimator right here, y divided by sigma i, x divided by sigma i, so that we have y star, x star. Sigma i, of course, is the square root of this, uh, this variance, right? Sigma i is a square root of the variance. So we get y star, x star. Step number three, 
run the regression y star over x star to calculate to the beta hat. This beta hat we call the beta hat GLS. GLS, of course, generalized this the square. Generalized uh, uh, in the sense, you know, we you know we do not directly run the uh, regression. We did some transformation at the very beginning, and then least the square, right? That's why we call it generalized least the square. Generalized square. Uh, that's the theory. How to do these, uh, you know, the steps by using computers. You don't have to do everything manually. So let me show you how to do it by using computer. Uh, if you want to do it by using computer, uh, we only have to calculate the residual square, for example. All of this residual square, let's call it U2. This is our step number one. This is our step number one, see? Our step number one is residual square. So that let's call it, you know, calculate this guy, right? So let's square all of this residuals. I call it U2 because this is a residual square, right? Once we have the residual square, then after that one, we can calculate our GLS estimator by using still our LM command. Beforewards, beforewards when, when our run the all of this regression, we just use LM command, Y squiggle, X1 plus X2, right? Now our GLS, our GLS actually, we further specify comma weights is one over U2. This is simply our GLS. This is simply our GLS commands. What's U2? U2 is exactly the, the, the square, the variance we just calculated before, right? So you can simply provide the, the variance to computer, one over the variance. And computer, the computer, once the computer have the variance, computer going to take, take square root. And then you know calculate the divided by the sigma i so on the first. So that basically we provide the variance to computer. Computer can gonna do everything else for us to, to do all those transformations around the regression, so on and so forth. Right? So so that's why the first step we simply calculate the residual square, which is a variance. So after afterwards, we simply provide one over U2 as weights, right? So computer gonna run the GLS regression, so on and so forth. Let me show you the results. So you provide the U2 variance and by using one over U2 as weights so that we do GLS. We still use LM command, but using weights so that we got our GLS estimator. The GLS estimator, when we summarize GLS, first of all, see, we have stars back, right? So what's the big deal about GLS? See, the star. In other words, based on GLS, if you want to test, if you want to test this beta two, beta two is a zero or non-zero, right? Based on GLS, since the p-value is 0 0.01, 0 0.01 is less than 0 0.05, so that we reject the null, right? What's our h now? Again, h now is uh, this beta, the coefficient is a zero, right? So that since this is smaller than 0 0.05, so that we reject the null, reject the null, h now is a zero, so that our, our coefficient is non-zero, right? So that based on GLS, we re recover the truth, so that we know this guy, the true coefficient of beta 2 is non-zero, right? Beforewards, based on all of this, based on all of this, see, we don't have any stars right here, right? You might run into the conclusion, okay, you know, uh, log income doesn't affect my consumption at all, right? So that based on all of this, you might run into the conclusion, income doesn't affect consumption. Again, that's simply because you violate your assumption too, right? So that, so that based on con discussion, you know, if your assumption too violate it, so that your test result cannot be trusted anymore, right? That's why we we do GLS transformation based on GLS. We recover the truth, right? So you can compare the coefficients right here, betas. They are, you know, roughly speaking, they're very close to all of this. But variance, it will be smaller. For example, see, 
the the standard error of beta two GLS zero point zero four GLS zero point zero four. Let's check out all of this. All of this, they are zero point nineteen, right? GLS reduces to zero point zero four, much smaller, right? That's basically the idea. GLS, you know, we are more efficient. The variance much smaller, right? Efficient means has a smaller variance, smaller standard error, right? That's why, that's why GLS, GLS standard error or variance is much smaller. If GL, you know, variance smaller, then of course, uh, if this guy is small, then first number divided by second number, T ratio will be large. See, 2.5 which is larger than 1.96, right? Significant again, right? If this T ratio is large, then p-value will be small, right? Smaller than 0 0.05. So that, that's why the GOS, we recover the truth because the results, right? So uh, let me talk about our homework. The homework, uh, 